A woman in a bright turquoise floral shawl hands my father to me in a navy blue gift bag, like we're at some absurdist birthday party. There's even a little card scotch taped to the brown plastic box inside the bag. Here it is. Uh, he is, she says. The, the remains. His remains. I'm sorry. I never know what to say, how to refer to uh, this. That's okay, I think. That makes two of us. Well, three, probably. <laughs> this can't be the same man who entertained us with countless highly animated stories of his childhood, whose practical jokes were the stuff of family legend, who, loves te who loved telling jokes and doing goofy voices for his grandkids. He can't fit in this bag. As the woman in the turquoise shawl organizes the paperwork, I take note of the mortuary. It seems displaced in time, like half a dozen interior designers from across the past century designed it by committee, and nobody could agree. Against the wall sits a worn, brown, floral sofa that I swear once belonged to every grandparent that ever lived. <laughs> Even from across the room, I know exactly how that sofa will smell and feel. Coarse and musty, but strangely comforting. Behind me is the chapel full of folding chairs facing the far wall while the doors along the side wall of the room are propped open. I wonder, are they airing it out? I know the beshawled woman introduced herself when I came in, but her name made no impression. I cannot bring her into focus. She's a vaguely 1987-shaped mass of Japanese flowers and cranes capped by unruly, coarse auburn hair. But for all these details, she might as well be invisible. Her face fades into the sea of hair, silk, and shoulder pads. My attention is settling on my dad and his little gift bag. I wonder if this is how her days go, an invisible distributor of grief. I suddenly feel a wave of empathy towards her. Does she have a family, friends? Who has she lost? She seems kind. I will never know her name. The out-of-focus woman in the decorative shawl goes over some formalities. He's heavier than he looks, she says. I look at the gift bag. So you should hold the bag from the bottom so it doesn't, you know. I picture an explosion of ashes at my feet as I make my way through the parking lot. <laughs> yes, I think I've shopped at Trader Joe's before. <laughs> I pick up the bag, placing my hand under it and hold it to my chest. Tears well in my eyes. I muster a thank you to the person-shaped blob in the for floral shawl who I will never know. Step out into the baking July heat and into the simmering parking lot. I had spent the last two months caring for my dad, carrying him through the house, lifting him from his bed to his walker, later his wheelchair, his recliner, the bathroom, the shower. It had struck me how heavy he was despite his frail frame. Lifting him day after day was some of the most physically demanding work of my life. Now he's so light by comparison. The closest thing I could compare it to would be a gallon of milk. Carrying him to the car in his little blue gift bag, I feel like the world's loneliest pallbearer. As I drive home with my dad's ashes buckled into the passenger seat, yes, I fasten the buckle, no, I don't know why. <laughs> I start to wonder what stories people will tell about him at his celebration of life. My dad was a wonderful storyteller and some of his best stories, which became our family's favorites, were about his mom. She outlived all my other grandparents as though her steady diet of martinis and cocktail olives had pickled her body, <laughs> preserving her ability to offer petty abuses to her family. <laughs> she was the kind of woman who picked favorite grandchildren and let the least favorites know, <laughs> whose will was full of scribbled margin notes. So-and-so is out of the will because they don't call me enough. Such and such is out of the will because they call too often, <laughs> and so on. For Christmas one year, she got me a nice camera. I didn't write her a thank you note fast enough, so for my birthday, just one week later, she got me a roll of exposed film. <laughs> we were at an Italian restaurant in the late 90s, and my mom ordered chicken fettuccine without the fettuccine. My grandma eyed her over the rim of her martini glass. Why no pasta, she slurred. Well, I'm on the Atkins diet, my mom explained. You don't eat carbs or pasta, it's supposed to help you lose weight. My grandma looked her up and down and said matter-of-factly, it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> At 
At another Italian restaurant, she announced to the room, I don't know why anyone would take Viagra. Who wants a four-hour stiffy? Not me. <laughs> we quickly paid the check and ushered her out the door, <laughs> vowing to avoid Italian restaurants altogether in the future. One year, at our family's vacation home, we were all sitting on the dock on the shore of a lake, enjoying a warm summer sunset. She was petting her dog, a hairy, smelly mop of a thing named Tojo, <laughs> after the Japanese general that killed my first husband, she explained. <laughs> petting the mop, lovingly. I'm, s I'm still not certain she didn't find a way to summon the general's spirit into that dog through sheer vitriol. Sitting on the dock, she took a sip of her vodka and then casually told her children and grandchildren, unpromote, unprompted, Last January, I came out here and looked down at the water and wondered how much effort it would take to hold myself under until I didn't come back up. <laughs> a moment as we all took in this information, silently deciding the bravest of the family, who would be the first to console her. Before we could offer a comforting word, she continued, but then I looked back and saw Tojo bouncing through the snow and realized, well, at least someone would miss me. <laughs> she took a long slug from her pint of vodka as she eyed her family with contempt. <laughs> Shortly before she died, she told us about how, about how her best friend at her assisted living facility died. Her account? Susan came, into the din came down to dinner at 5 o'clock. They serve dinner at 5. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Susan came down and started saying something like, <laughs> So I said, Susan, nobody can understand you. And she said, <laughs> And I said, Susan, you've had a stroke. Nobody understands you. Go upstairs and go to bed. So she did, and the next morning she was dead. When we asked her why she didn't tell the nurses about Susan's stroke, she said, well, nobody said anything when I had my stroke. <laughs> this was, I repeat, her best friend. <laughs> Petty is an understatement. My grandma passed away in her sleep, Tojo sitting on her lap, a small consolation for the Japanese general to outlive his captor. After her death, our family gathered to tell stories of her terror in loving, reverential tones, <laughs> spiked with laughter. Because for all her malice, snark, snipes, and cruelty, she was, above all, funny. Her wit, like her insults, was acerbic. She could craft a bitingly funny story only to cap it with a soul-crushing barb that would shake your sense of self-worth to its foundation. <laughs> she passed her storytelling prowess down to her sons, but thankfully, they swapped her cruelty for kindness. My dad and uncles can, well, could, spin a, spin a yarn to rival Rumpelstiltskin. That was her gift to them, to us. As I drove home from the mortuary, I wondered what stories we'd share about my dad, wondered how I could talk about him, how I could ever hope to capture all of him in one eulogy. Everything felt disproportionate, like this bag of ashes, all too small to be him. A few days before his celebration of life, the storm that had threatened to dampen our party officially became a hurricane. We'd already ordered the food, the booze, and invited the guests, so we held my dad's celebration in the middle of the first hurricane to hit San Diego in 150 years. Now, my dad had amassed a small barometer collection, a wholly unnecessary venture given San Diego's unremarkable meteorology. <laughs> Missed it by this much, Dad. <laughs> now we gathered on a dark and stormy night, well, afternoon, really, to tell stories about a man who loved to tell stories and who had a collection of instruments to measure dark and stormy nights, or afternoons. As the rain and wind hammered the windows, nearly 200 family and friends gathered to eat, drink, and toast to my dad. 
Wind howled outside as we shared stories and told his favorite jokes, including the first PG-13 joke he ever taught me. Goes like this. I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Here is my handle, here is... I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Here is my handle, here... Oh, fuck, I'm a sugar bowl. It was like the world's most joyous campfire, complete with ghost stories of a sort. Now, I believe in ghosts, the supernatural, the other side, whatever you might want to call it. I can think of at least a half a dozen times in my life where I've had a brush with something that did not seem tethered to this plane of existence. My dad occasionally took advantage of that. We'd scare each other on midnight walks through the woods in the Pacific Northwest, or he'd plot with neighbors to appear silhouetted in the windows if we were watching a scary movie. In the summer of 1999, at 16 years old, some friends and I went to opening weekend of the Blair Witch Project, back when everyone thought it was real. (laughs) The film ends with an iconic image. The Blair Witch has captured two of our hikers. The final hiker makes her way to the basement, where the camera lifts to reveal one of the friends standing in the corner, facing the wall. The woman holding the camera screams in panic before something causes her to drop the camera, and the screen goes to black. My friends and I left the theater that night thinking that this was, in essence, a terrifying documentary. As we piled into my beat-up Volkswagen van, I called my dad from my chunky Nokia cell phone. Dad, the movie just let out. I'm dropping my friends off and then coming home, but could you, uh, could you make sure to leave the lights on? <laughs> sure, no problem, he says cheerily. I drop my friends off and head home. I pull up, and my stomach drops. The front door is wide open. <laughs> And every light, including the porch light, is off. (laughs) I step inside. Dad? I try the lamp next to the door. Nothing. Dad, this isn't funny. (laughs) Dad? (laughs) My bedroom is on the other end of the house, but it's a straight shot from the front door. I book it and slam my door. Of course, the lights don't work in my room either full of teenage rage, but also not in substantial amount of fear. I yell through the door, Dad, I know it's you. Dad, come out. Turn on the lights, Dad. (laughs) No response. I look around my room, my eyes adjusting to the darkness when I see something. There in the dark, standing in the corner of my room, a large figure his back to me. I scream at him. Dad, Dad, I know it's you. Stop it. (laughs) No response. I panic. The Blair Witch has me. (laughs) Now, my dad eventually laughs and breaks the terrifying illusion. Now, there's one detail I want to highlight. This is effectively pre-Google. You couldn't just look up the ending to an opening weekend movie, so I have no idea how he knew it. And for the rest of his life, he would feign ignorance whenever I told this story. (laughs) He knew how to commit to a bit. (laughs) I wouldn't be surprised if the flickering lights that have manifested in our home since he died are not only due to faulty mid-century wiring. (laughs) Now, telling that story about my dad and dozens of others in the middle of a raging hurricane, I'm struck by the way that these funny, ridiculous, embarrassing stories can bring the people we love back into the room for a moment. It's a way to summon them, like a little seance. Picking my dad up from the mortuary, he felt so small, so much less than what he was in life. And as the storm raged on, I realized that what my dad really was to me, what can't be captured by a few pounds of ashes, was stories. More than that, a storyteller. A gift he got from his mom and a gift he bestowed upon me. From my grandma to my dad. My dad to me. We have learned to transmute pain and joy into laughter, our own straw into gold, our version of Rumpelstiltskin. I get to talk about him, about his mom, about our family, about us. What a gift. It even came with a navy blue gift bag. All right, give it up for A.J. Knox.